Um, Janet is one of the most uh, well-known and renowned scientists in, in, uh, in regenerative medicine and stem cell biology. Um, just left as chief of research at SickKids um, and uh, is the um, uh, director, scientific director and president of OIRM, but is now moving to take on the same position for the Gardner Foundation. Uh, which is uh, wonderful for the Gardner, Gardner Foundation to have Janet taking on that uh, role. Um, look, Janet is a, a, a wonderful scientist, uh, um, and but a great friend uh, to CCRM and the community, and has been a wonderful supporter of us. So, Janet, thank you for being here today. tell you a little bit about OIRM uh, and where we fit in this sort of ecosystem that we're all talking about here in regenerative medicine. And then a little bit, because I was asked to, to talk about some of the relationships, the academic relationships in stem cell research that have long gone on between Canada and Japan and some of the ways that we're still taking those forward. So the Ontario Institute for Regenerative Medicine uh, really is, sorry, is a standalone uh, not-for-profit entity that really encompasses everything we might think about in regenerative medicine, from discovery to clinic to commercialization and also to education and outreach. And really, we, like everyone else, are facing these questions. How can we deal with some of the diseases, chronic and degenerative diseases that affect all of us uh, and cost the healthcare system, directly and indirectly, very large amounts of money and so regenerative medicine is a potential way of really <coughs> treating the, these diseases like heart disease, diabetes, other diseases in ways that are revolutionary because they actually produce cures. And so the, the benefit to the healthcare system is enormous if we can actually translate these to the clinic. So here we are, the Ontario Institute. We were established in 2014, building on a network of activities across the province that's been going on for several years that really came about because we had a national stem cell network. So on, this is the Ontario branch of really an entity that goes across the country. Established with support from the Ministry of Research and Innovation uh, of the Ontario government. And our uh, mission, our vision is clear. We want to revolutionize the treatment of degenerative diseases and we want to make Ontario a global leader in the development of stem cell-based therapies and products. And so that means translation. This is a translation-based institute, but it builds on the excellence that exists and we intend to continue to enhance in, in fundamental stem cell and regenerative medicine research in Ontario. And as I say, an important part of our mandate is to educate and engage the public about stem cell science and regenerative medicine in order to gain their support and help them understand how this is going to affect them in the future. So why Ontario? Why is this the only uh, on an institute we have in Canada at the moment in regenerative medicine? Well, this is really the home of stem cells. I don't have to tell anyone here this, that uh, hematopoietic stem cells were first discovered here. But it's been an ongoing uh, hub for scientific discovery for many, many years. And we've built this collaborative network uh, of over 170 scientists and their programs. And that's biologists, it's biomedical engineers, translational clinicians, really building that uh, uh, complete ecosystem. And of course, part of that ecosystem, and very important, is CCRM, which is our commercialization partner. We have the infrastructure, we have clinical infrastructure, and we have the ability to implement cell therapy trials here. And as heard from Health Canada, we believe we have a favorable regulatory environment uh, and we have a lot of philanthropic support for this uh, in Canada. So this is the overall model of OIRM. This is the sort of pipeline that you might think of. We have we identified several disease areas where there is unmet need and we have activities in Ontario where we believe we can make a difference and they're lifted across the top. But really this starts at the bottom with the fundamental discoveries, the leading science, taking it through to training the next generation. That's incredibly important and then being able to take discoveries through these cross-cutting platforms, <coughs> many of which really are associated with CCRM, including uh, biomanufacturing, GMP production, and very importantly, this whole regulatory ethics and reimbursement strategy that is critical to translation. And then
and CCRM helps add value to the discoveries and we hope to take through with industry and uh, government support into innovative clinical trials here and of course in the end cures. And it's important to point out that there are regenerative medicine trials already ongoing in Ontario. This just lists some of them uh, that affect different tissues with different kinds of sources of cells. So these are ongoing and when we talk about the future we're talking about the next generation of regenerative medicine and the next generation of regenerative medicine products. In particular, there is an ongoing interest and an ongoing strength here in products derived from pluripotent stem cells. So OIRM, with its funding, how are we going to make a difference? We, don't, we have to use our funding carefully, and we focused on four areas in our first disease team grants that are just going out the door. And the four areas that were approved and uh, by an international peer review process are heart regeneration with stem cells uh, and uh, derived from uh, pluripotent cells, uh, repairing white matter in the brain, a stem cell approach to regeneration of the, to repair the spinal cord, and a cellular therapy for so I can't say that one septic shock. And so those are the four that we're supporting right now. <coughs> CCRM is involved in all of these to help add value and we'll be hoping to move these down the pipeline over the next couple of years. But along with that, we continue to support the base through new ideas, grants, postdocs, and fellowships. We have a lot of workshops to help people think about how to move their own products forward, and we're very engaged in patient and public engagement. So partnerships is key, and we build partnerships, research and commercial partnerships, locally, nationally, internationally. We have already built this network across Ontario, we are very closely aligned and interacting with the health charities in the different disease spaces. And of course, because we are in Canada and we're not alone, we do interact a lot with other provincial and federal uh, institutions. And in fact, we're doing a sort of road tour at the moment across the country to make, to make sure that we, people understand where we sit in Ontario and how we can partner across the country. But importantly, and more relevant to the talks today, international partnerships are extremely important. Stem cell regenerative medicine research does cannot be done by one group alone. It really depends on partnerships. And we already have strong partnerships with China and with Japan. And in particular with Japan, a long time now, there's been a lot of collaborations at the academic level between Japan and China. The iPS cell development from uh, Dr. Yamanaka was a great impetus to us back here in Ontario. We set up the first iPS facility in Canada, right here in Ontario, with help and support from uh, Yamanaka's group. And in fact, we've seen ongoing exchanges between the different labs between Canada and Japan. And in particular, we've been supported by a granting program between the CIHR, federal agency here, and the Japan Agency for Medical Research and Development that has actually supported three, disease, three teams working together in collaborative research in stem cells and disease applications. And I'll just tell you a little bit about those. You can find out a lot more about them if you're interested. But it just illustrates how the partnerships have developed. The first one is led by John Dick here in, in Toronto, and in Japan by Hiro Nakayuchi in Tokyo. And they've had a long collaboration around hematopoietic stem cells and have brought more people to the table in this collaborative approach, which is really trying to understand the epigenetic differences between normal stem cells uh, that make the hematopoietic system and abnormal stem cells that make up leukemia and trying to use and understand the epigenetic differences between normal and abnormal cells to both enhance the production of normal hematopoietic stem cells, but also think about how we might be able to cure leukemia. And this is all an interactive process and shared personnel and populations really drive this process forward. I actually lead a different uh, uh, team in Canada in, with Hitoshi Miwa, who again, I've had long uh, partnerships with over many years. And this one is based on understanding pluripotency, those important cells that make every cell type in the body, and how they differ from the other cell type that arises in the embryo, the trotoblast. And this has brought together, again, groups in Japan and in Canada. And what we're looking at here is how we can turn a pluripotent cell into a placental trotoblast cell, the understanding of the epigenetics of that process. And in particular, we want to use our information that we know a lot about in the mouse 
to derive human trophoblast stem cells that we can use to study uh, pregnancy diseases and really open up a new stem cell area. And then finally, the last group is headed up by Andres Nagy, who's really a leader in pluripotent stem cell research here in, in Toronto, uh, and partnering with uh, two, work, two um, faculty members from CIRA in Kyoto, not with Yamanaka because he has so much money from the Japanese government that he's not allowed to apply to this program. Yes. So uh, we have members of his faculty, uh, and, uh, but not being himself. Uh, and so uh, this is actually a very important project as well. And it's a very interesting one, looking at the relationship between uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, which are produced by these special reprogramming factors, and cancer cells showing that if you do a little bit of reprogramming, you can get dysplastic cells, you can get cancer cells, you can get teratomas, but if you go all the way, you get normal cells again. So understanding this process, will it actually help us turn cancer cells into normal cells? So a very exciting interaction indeed. So those represent academic interactions, but in all cases, I think you can see that they have the potential in the future for commercial implications. And it really just it illustrates this ongoing exchange at the intellectual level that really helps drive what we hope to see at the commercial level in the future. So what can we do in the future? What's happening now? We are exchanging trainees through these programs. We've seen Canadian stem cell uh, trained faculty in Japan. In fact, one of the faculty at CIRA who's on that last grant is from a uh, lab here in Toronto. We have academic partnerships, and we're starting to see through CCRM and other activities heard about Replicel. Uh, we've seen activities between Canada uh, in the stem cell IP area. And I do believe that as we move forward in this interesting uh, uh, future where we're looking at bringing innovative cell therapies to the clinic, that we have the opportunity if we can align regulatory uh, environments to really think about partner trials between Canada and Japan. So I think this is a, a very exciting and a very useful and productive interaction that we've had for many years. We have a few minutes for questions now. Stephen? Are there any plans to go to OIRM outside of make it more of a national organization? Or is it going to be very Ontario focused? Well, you can see that I have Ontario put in all those slides because we are funded by the Ontario exactly. government. And obviously, that has to be our focus. But of course, we see ourselves as part absolutely of a national network. We come out of the Canadian Stem Cell Network, which, for those who don't know, is, a, is a, a, an NCE, a federally funded network, that has to sunset after 14 years. So we, there is a big initiative now to try to uh, persuade and engage the federal government in ways that we can re-establish the network across the country. But even without the federal funding, OIRM itself has been reaching out to our partners across the country and we're building, again, uh, interactions where at the uh, academic level, but also, again, through CCRM at the commercial level as well. So yes, uh, we see Ontario because the investment has been strong here, both provincially and, in fact, nationally. We see that as the hub that we, are, we want to see, uh, hubs and spokes across the country. We were going to Quebec. <laughs> he knows I was there. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? So I was wondering, can you mention a little bit more, uh, there's also this Canadian Stem Cell Foundation that has a lot of money and it uh, has a target goals, I think, for five to 10 cell therapies. Can you say whether some of your um, goals overlap or how you work with other groups like that? So the Canadian Stem Cell Foundation is really a, 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 a public outreach and advocacy, advocacy organization supporting uh, the importance of stem cell research in Canada. And indeed, their advocacy goal is indeed to bring more funding to the area and ensure that we see stem cell therapies going through to the clinic. So OIRM, CCRM are partners and engaged with, with their advocacy activities. But you know, we're off and running and we wanna, we're, we're not stopping waiting for more funding. We have to work uh, through what we have right now. 
and, you know, the action plan that they, they focus on was um, was created by us in, in collaboration with other groups and them. So there's there's a lot of alignment there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Janet. All right, well, uh, it, uh, it's now time to hear uh, uh, an example of, uh, of uh, an industry collaboration, and it's my pleasure to, to have Lee Buckler, um, one of the most networked and well-known leaders in the space. Uh, unfortunately, uh, now that he is CEO of Replicel, he couldn't uh, find his way through the snow to get to Washington, uh, but um, I know you wanted to be there, and. Uh, chat about it later, but uh, uh, Lee, uh, Lee has been kind of leading in the field for many years from, uh, from in different ways and sitting on boards, but uh, right now is heavily focused on, on Replicel and uh, has been doing a lot of work in Japan, so Lee, thank you for being here. Thanks, <coughs> so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Jetro and CCRM and uh, for all of you up, up coming here. I'm um, a very passionate um, entrepreneur um, and executive in the cell therapy space um, and now I'm CEO of Replicel. So I'm just here to tell you a little story about, about Replicel and how we're engaged and involved in, in Japan, uh, both through our, re our relationship with Shiseido, which we're very, very proud of, as well as some of the other things we're doing in Japan. And just to give you, um, as an executive in the space um, and a company in the space, some of the, uh, I guess, ramifications, implications, and, uh, and a little bit of a perspective on, um, on, on these changes uh, in Japan um, um, from our perspective, we are a publicly traded company. I may or may not make some forward-looking statements, which you should not uh, rely on from an investment perspective. <laughs> so I will make two. I'll, I'll give you two <coughs> slides uh, just about the Replicel process, just to give you some perspective. We are an autologous cell therapy company. The, uh, the cell therapy products that we are developing are all derived from a single suture biopsy taken from the back of the patient's head. This is a punch biopsy about the size of your thumbnail. We de we're developing products from two different cell populations derived from the hair follicles embedded in that tissue biopsy. One is the dermal sheath cup cell population, which sits at the base of the hair follicle. This is the subject of the partnership with Shiseido Company. It's a single purpose product, we think, uh, designed um, ultimately for the treatment of androgenic alopecia, which is the primary cause for pattern baldness amongst um, men and women. Um, and the other cell population, which is a platform technology, we think ultimately responsible for products both in the dermatology and orthopedic space, um, is a fibroblast cell population derived from the sheath of the hair follicle, everything to do with the tissue of that follicle and very little to do with hair growth at all. It's a simple cell expansion play. We don't differentiate the cells. We don't uh, modify the cells in any way. We have a simple philosophy of life. We have a cell population. We think we understand what they do. We expand them, we grow more of them. We deliver them locally, not systemically, to have to, to, for those cells to function in a therapeutic way um, that's aligned with their normal and natural and homologous function. We cryopreserve, unlike a lot of uh, autologous cell therapy companies, we've invested in cryopreserving the product. So we freeze those cells in vials and ship them back into the clinic, to the clinic for reinjection. And in the case of two of our um, indications, we have a proprietary injector for the, uh, for, the, for the injection of those cells. So where we are clinically, all of our products are now in clinical development. Um, the original product uh, of the company is this um, is RCHL1, the dermal sheath cup cell population for androgenic alopecia. We completed a phase one trial in that and partnered it with, uh, with Shiseido, and we're now um, poised uh, for the next phase trial of that in Japan. Um, uh, the, the other fibroblast cell population are in two clinical indications right now, one for chronic Achilles tendinosis, which is in a phase one, two, approved by Health Canada um, that we're treating patients in, uh, in a single site standard, um, in a single site study, uh, placebo randomized controlled um, study um, in the sports medicine clinic at University of British Columbia. And the other is enrolling patients now um, and treating patients uh, which uh, in, in, uh, in Germany. It's a dermatology trial, maybe the first cell therapy trial in the world actually employing um, healthy volunteers. So we are um, um, biopsying patients in a dermatology study, looking to see whether we can uh, affect the extracellular, the repair and, and regeneration of the extracellular matrix under the skin in those patients who um, are um, who have a, a waning extracellular matrix due to age or uh, or or sun or other environmental damages, the two ten, the two trials the top two trials the tendinosis and, and dermatology trials will lead out data um, this year. 
and we are um, uh, very committed to a licensing strategy. So we believe that um, 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 uh, ultimately we don't get up in the morning to take a single one of our products to market. We, uh, we uh, aspire to develop um, products through mid-stage clinical development and then do exactly what we did with, uh, with Shiseido um, for our androgenic alopecia product, and that is to license those and co-develop those products with sophisticated um, regional or multinational players. So um, um, uh, Colin Novick and I recently published a paper um, in a relatively new journal called Bio Cell Therapy Bioinsights, um, where I sort of take this, we take this, um, some of the salient points of this talk and, um, and flush them out in much greater detail and encourage you to take a look at that article if you have a chance. So I'll tell you a little bit about the Shiseido deal. So in 2012, um, the technology that the company was founded around um, <coughs> completed a trial um, in Europe um, and published the data from that trial. It was, the, it was um, 16 patients in a trial um, for, of, uh, of, of men and women who um, have androgenic alopecia, which is pattern baldness. The, the mechanism of this disease is that the, the DHT, which is an androgen hormone, attaches to the receptors of the dermal sheath cup cells at the base of the hair follicle. And there's a direct correlation between the disappearance of this cell population, which is a motherhood cell population that supports the hair growth, um, all the cell interactions that support hair growth, and there's a direct correlation between the dis disappearance of that cell population and the diminishing of the hair, fi of the hair fiber. At the back of the head, the, the cell population lacks the receptor for, that to, for the disease to be functional. That's why most bald people you see on the street still have hair at the back of their head. That's why you can do microtransplant surgery and take the whole hair follicle and the, and the cells embedded in that, transplant it to the top, and if it takes it, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a functional cure because that hair follicle will continue and the cells embedded in it are immune to the, to, the, to, the, to the function of the disease. So we're looking to extract the cells which lack the receptor, grow more of them and transplant them to the top of the scalp where we've seen in animal studies they home to the base of the hair follicle which was where they naturally reside to take up a function which they naturally perform and that is um, support the growth of, of, of new hair fibers. And so um, it's a functional cure. So when, Shis when we published that data, Shiseido, which is a company very, very invested in hair growth and hair health, um, saw that data. They'd also done a lot of their own research and they'd, done, they'd hire some external consultants to look for a <coughs> next generation technology for the treatment of androgenic alopecia in particular. Um, when we published that data, they, we were in the luxury of having them actually knock on our door. And so six months from that initial conversation, um, um, uh, it was six months from that initial conversation to ink on the paper of a signed deal. And uh, the deal was is described as a $35 million deal plus sales royalties uh, for the life of the product. It was $4 million up front in terms of the licensing fee, $31 million in uh, commercial milestone payments. So not development milestone payments, but commercial. And then um, so sales royalties, like I say. But uh, most importantly, from, from, me, from my perspective in the interim, Shiseido is also committed to funding uh, all the clinical trials in their network, in their, in, their, in their markets, the manufacturing in their markets, the regulatory interactions and approvals in their markets, and eventually the sales marketing and distribution costs related to, uh, to, the, to the product sales. So it's been a very collaborative, as you would expect, a, a, a licensing a product after phase one. This requires a, 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 an incredibly close and ongoing collaboration to ensure that there's a single product being developed here globally, even though this is only a regional um, um, exclusive license. So we continue to iterate on the development of the product, the science around the product, um, and Shiseido is about ready now. So they, um, this was signed in 2013 before the regulations were uh, finalized and put in place. Um, and Shiseido is uh, a built a facility in Kobe, Japan. We have transferred the, the, the manufacturing to that facility. We've run the validation runs. The facility's now been certified by the PMDA, um, and they've initiated the clinical sites. And we're uh, one committee review away from initiating this trial. So we expect that trial to initiate in the coming weeks, um, subject to that committee's uh, uh, approval, of course. What's interesting about the, the, um, the pathway that Shiseido is pursuing uh, here is that, um, um, as, uh, as was uh, uh, shown to you earlier today, there are two pathways for clinical research in Japan. There is the, um, the pathway under the revised PMD Act, 
which leads to potentially a conditional approval and a final approval. There's also the clinical, what we call the clinical research path, or the pathway under the new, completely new act, which is the Act for the Safety of Regenerative Medicine, <coughs> under which you're assigned one of three tiers um, based on the, the, the safety risk or profile of your product. And Shiseido is pursuing, um, sponsoring the research under the clinical research pathway. It's possible to still go to market with, uh, with a product investigated under that pathway. There are reimbursement ramifications to an eventual commercialization under that pathway as I understand it. But what's important here is that you know, this is an aesthetics product. And so um, a reimbursement is not necessarily one of our primary drivers. This is a largely going to be a cash pay, consumer pay type of product. So the reimbursement ramifications that might be important to a company um, otherwise in deciding which pathway to pursue uh, were largely irrelevant for us in Shiseido um, in determining the pathway here, although that decision is entirely Shiseido's decision um, because it's their product in, in their marketplace. So this is a picture of the, of the spec facility. Um, it's in Kobe where the Japanese government has um, given some tax incentives and tax breaks for locating a facility in this region as part of the economic diversification and part of the larger sort of abenomics picture um, related to uh, Japan's investment in, um, in regenerative medicine. Um, and uh, and uh, so far it's a, it's a facility completely dedicated to the production of our product because it's the only regenerative medicine product that Shiseido has. And, and you know, keep in mind for Shiseido, um, this is the first injectable of any kind that the company has engaged in. So it's a very brave um, um, a project for them, um, not only to have to, to, to make that bridge into an injectable as a company that's built its empire on, on, on topicals, but also to have an injectable that's based on cells. Um, so this is a, this is a very brave, um, has been a very brave engagement on their part. So uh, you know, I, I, I thought a little bit about what's, what's been the impact of this relationship for us um, because, of course, you know, keeping in mind our, our licensing strategy, we're actively pursuing, um, uh, with Shiseido's full uh, uh, awareness, obviously, the licensing of our other products um, in Japan as well. Because what's happened here with the evolution of these regulations is it's, create, it's, it's made Japan um, a, a much higher priority for foreign companies like ourselves than it otherwise might have been. So we're a Canadian, it's very small, West Coast Canadian company, Japan would have been, for the most part, a, a fairly low priority in terms of our commercialization or even clinical research um, strategy. Um, as a result of the evolution of, uh, of these regulations, Japan has become a very important part of our commercialization and clinical research strategy and partnership strategy. So we backed into this opportunity by virtue of our, of our, of our uh, agreement and relationship with Shiseido, but now we're leveraging that relationship with Shiseido and the profile that's come from that to, to, to most aggressively pursue licensing and co-development agreements similar to that for our other products. Because, for example, if we had launched our um, uh, Achilles tendinosis trial in Yokohama, as opposed to Vancouver, just by way of example, we would be, we think, 15 months away from the kind of data that might be eligible for conditional approval, um, uh, whereas you know, uh, what we will have in Canada is uh, data from a phase one, two, A type of trial, the, you know, long on the pathway to commercialization. So, um, of course, the conditional approval designation is completely up to the regulatory authorities in Japan. That's not something we can dictate, but we think it's the kind of data package that, um, uh, that would, based on our uh, predicate science, certainly make it eligible and, and make it um, a position for um, the opportunity for us not only to have uh, conditional approval from a respected regulatory authority, but also the opportunity, as you will appreciate, um, to generate revenue from a product being sold on the market, drive that revenue back into our ongoing um, clinical trials elsewhere in the world. So we're one of, um, of, a, of, of two foreign cell therapy companies with cell therapy manufacturing footprint, uh, one of a handful with a partnership in place um, already, uh, one of a few foreign cell therapy companies with a clinical trial poised to commence in Japan. There's a host of companies now pursuing PMGA review um, of their products, and we're very excited to see a critical mass of foreign companies engaged in Japan, um, because we believe it's you know there's a there's a there's a, a rising tide sort of mentality to this. 
we've uh, we've been very pleased with with also the market pull that we've seen in Japan. So it's one thing to say there's a there's a, a great enthusiasm by foreign companies to go into Japan to be active in Japan, but it's also very important to see a receptive audience there, not only amongst potential partners, but also we've seen a receptive audience amongst investors who see the opportunity to go shopping for foreign technologies and somehow invest in the opportunity to bring them to Japan. Um, to take advantage of this expedited market access program, and also had you know tremendous support from the Ministry of Economic Trade and Industry, METI, which is the the, the parent organization um, uh, above Jetro. From Jetro itself, we went through the, um, the, the there's a mechanism to engage Jetro to become a formal client of Jetro's, which gives you um, the advantage and opportunity to engage Jetro for support and services that you might, that you otherwise don't get. We've had the opportunity now to engage Jetro for one of those projects, and it's been, they've been, they were very, very helpful. Also found the PMGA to be very, um, so far, very proactive in terms of their recommendations of how we might engage them on the review of our uh, fiberglass platform, um, which we want to uh, uh, get through the approval process and engage uh, with another partnership. So we've been very pleased, but obviously it takes um, uh, you know, a fair amount of time and energy and boots on the ground in Japan. And there's, there's uh, you know, we have now engaged the PMDA in a formal review um, and are prepared for now a form, our first review of the manufacturing quality and safety data um, of our NBDS program. Um, um, and there's a number of, I'll, I'm gonna skip, just first of all, I'll come back to this, but um, you know, I, I'll skip to, I think, some of the salient points that, that we've learned in our, in our interactions with Japan um, um, uh, because I think it's the most, it's the most useful. So uh, you know, I, I, I put these in terms of frequently asked questions that we get asked a lot from people that we interact with. So can therapeutic candidates developed and manufactured outside of Japan now qualify to use the regulatory framework? And I think we've heard that answered today to some extent. You know, what we've heard is that data from outside Japan will be considered to support applications um, um, uh, but that what needs to happen for a conditional approval is some kind of study uh, in Japan. We've heard today that it can involve um, foreign, um, um, uh, foreign um, study participants, but that what's most important is that the, uh, the trial needs to be happened in Japan, even though um, um, the manufacturing may uh, be done outside of Japan. Will a Japanese partner be needed to bring a product to the PMGA for conditional approval? I, our sense is the answer is that it's, that it's not a predicate, that it's not a prerequisite. Um, certainly our perspective, our own perspective, my own perspective, is that, um, is that it's certainly much preferable. Um, it facilitates things, um, uh, not only from in terms of your interactions with PMGA, but in terms of uh, uh, market adoption, et cetera. But should we not find the necessary partner for our fiberglass platform in time, uh, we will consider pursuing our own clinical trial um, as um, other companies like Pluristem um, are, 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 are apparently um, per, um, are planning to do as well. Have we seen an appetite amongst Japanese companies uh, to partner with foreign companies to bring cell therapies to Japan? One would surmise that that would be the case. One would certainly hope that that would be the case. It's been our personal uh, um, experience that that is now the case, although um, it, it didn't happen as quickly as one might have imagined. So I started going to Japan um, even before the regulations were finalized and found, much to my surprise, a, a, a much more reticence among the Japanese companies than I would have expected with the anticipation of these rules coming into play. And I think it's because even the Japanese, uh, my perspective is the Japanese nationals found themselves even a little bit skeptical that these rules would, would take it would come into effect as they were as they were being planned, until they and until they did and until they were finalized, um, there was there was some reticence. But when they were finalized, we found Japanese companies quickly started to um, to, to to plan their own strategies and to make their own um, um, efforts to go out um, and look for uh, for various technologies. I think what's what'll be one of the things that'll be fascinating in terms of the Japan experiment from a commercial perspective is how. The difference in venture capital in Japan um, will influence how um, uh, Japanese products are, 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 are commercialized. So there's a very different um, mentality and structure around investment and investment strategies and the availability of capital in Japan that we might be accustomed to, uh, particularly in the United States or, or in Canada, 
Um, oftentimes, their investments is, is more corporate, it's more strategic, it's more um, uh, aligned with, uh, with, the, with the partnering companies than um, simply um, large uh, venture capital funds or hedge funds investing in plays. And so I think that influences how one goes about positioning um, uh, products in Japan. Certainly, you know, now that we have the precedent of Mesoblast um, uh, having their first formal approval and the reimbursement decision around that, and we have Turamo as being the heart sheet, as being the first conditional approval and reimbursement around that, we're starting to, to get some comfort both as foreign companies and we're starting to see comfort on the Japanese investment and strategic partner side of the equation, more comfort around exactly how this looks like it's going to be rolled out. And, you know, in a way, it's not so different from, you know, some of the conditional approval mechanisms we've seen in other countries and some of the orphan drug sort of early, early approval mechanisms we've seen in other countries um, um, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a unique Japanese flavor. And Michael and I were just talking, for instance, about one of the potential ramifications of, of the strategy being around reimbursement, where reimbursement is typically... Um, uh, defined as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a function or at least informed as part of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, um, of the inputs of cost versus benefit. And when you're deciding reimbursement before you've really well defined either cost or benefit, um, it'll be interesting to see how those early reimbursement decisions carry forward, whether they'll be revisited around final approval um, or not, for instance. Um, uh, the other interesting policy implication that's, that's uh, I think, an interesting exercise, we'll make it perhaps more of an intellectual exercise than a, than a commercial one, is the fact that this whole Japanese experiment, which allows for early conditional approval on relatively small um, data sets, um, um, is allowed only because, um, I would argue, other countries are not doing it. So, for instance, we'll never be able to if one were to get a conditional approval of a product in Japan, uh, a, a conduct a placebo-controlled trial in Japan after that were to happen. Because no patient would want to subject themselves to the potential to have placebo when the product is already on the market. So from a, from a, from a, from a post-marketing data submission perspective, uh, we will, of course, be submitting post-marketing data um, of, uh, of follow-up from the patients that are being treated of a, of a commercially available product. But the, the data from placebo-controlled trials will have to come from other countries um, where we would, we would have to be engaged in those trials. So these are some, some interesting policy um, and uh, implications of, 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 the, of the experiment that we're seeing happen in Japan, which would be very exciting to sort of follow and follow also the commercial implications of those. Right? So in terms of advice for, for companies in a, in a similar position to us, and I'll, I'll wrap up in a second, you know, I think it's important to develop a clear strategy for what you're looking to do in Japan. Uh, it's important to spend, uh, you know, real time in Japan. I'm always surprised when I'm over there at conferences in Japan how few people with my color of skin are, are there, despite the fact that, that it seems as though there's a lot of enthusiasm by foreign cell therapy companies. Um, you know, it takes a lot of energy. One of the things we've decided to do, which I think has been a tremendous advantage for us, is to actually employ Japanese-speaking people as part of our staff. This has really facilitated our ability to communicate with people, to prepare, you know, keep in mind all of this, all of the materials that are submitted to the PMDA have to be done in Japanese. So all of your protocols, all of your data, all of your manufacturing, um, everything, everything that's submitted to the PMDA has to be done in Japanese language. And so this is our Herculean effort. And if you're to pay for translation services for those, that's a, that's a, that's a lot of work. Um, so it's one of the things to consider um, if you're looking to do business there. Um, and, and we've also had great interactions with uh, with firm, with uh, Armit. We've one of the early companies to to engage with Armit. They were also very very helpful. So I encourage you to take advantage of all the things that have been suggested um, here to you, as um, as ways to uh, to figure out your strategy and to figure out the opportunity there. And I'm available for questions after this. Thank you. So, so let's have some questions now. If uh, if anyone has any. Um you can answer them in a few minutes, or maybe not answer them. I'll, I'll help you though. <laughs> Stephen, what, what was the biggest challenge for you in dealing with the Japanese partner besides the language issue or a cultural issue or business confusion? 
the question was what was the biggest challenge in, in dealing with a Japanese partner? I mean, certainly language is, language is a barrier, the cultural practice is a barrier. You know, one of the things, we're a, we're a company kind of in this aesthetics, sports, medicine um, industry, and so uh, uh, our natural partners aren't necessarily the biopharma, uh, the typical biopharma partners, like one would consider um, as, as a partner in a, in a cell therapy uh, uh, enterprise. So, whereas, you know, most, a lot of people would look to the GSKs and the Vardises and, and um, um, of the world, we're looking to companies like the Shiseidos, um, the Allergans, Galdermas uh, of the world who aren't necessarily familiar, as familiar with biologics as, uh, uh, as, 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 as might be the case otherwise. We were tremendously surprised, this isn't answering the challenge, we were actually tremendously surprised by, um, by how easy the product tech transferred over to Shiseido. They hired the right people, they had the right internal expertise. Um, they, you know, they got the manufacturing infrastructure in place. So while I would have expected that to have been a bigger hurdle uh, with a company like Shiseido, where this was the first time uh, they'd manufactured anything like this, the first time they'd had any kind of injectable product, we've been very pleased with how easy that goes. That goes in part, I guess, to the robustness of our product and protocols, but also in part to their commitment to making sure that they were, you know, the Shiseido's a, a company, um, regardless of the fact that this is a, a first um, um, a kind of a first generation kind of product for them. They're a, a company very committed to, to, to deep science and to, and to doing it right. Um, it, it, it's been, they're very reticent to proceed um, without our complete endorsement from a, in a collaborative sense, um, and so have been have been shy to take bold steps on their own from a, from a scientific and clinical manufacturing perspective, but in a way that that's a benefit because although uh, it requires a fair amount of, of hand-holding and, and really intense collaboration, um, that's good news for us because ultimately my biggest concern as, a, as the licensor is that they go off and do something and develop a product that's different. You know, I, it's very important to me to make sure we're co-developing this product and we have a single product we can develop. Um, so it's been a, it's very, a, very, a very useful collaboration, and I think having Japanese people, Japanese-speaking people, and Japanese nationals on our staff has helped make the collaboration easier than it might have otherwise have, have been, because there are inevitably huge, enormous, you know, cultural, language, and commercial differences in our enterprises. We have, you know, the valuations of, of regenerative medicine companies uh, in Japan are very healthy. Um, and so far, you know, we've taken a few stabs at looking at this. And so far, the advice of our bankers has been that it's an enormously time intensive uh, and costly procedure to get um, uh, listed there that probably for our capacities isn't warranted at the moment. Something that we'll continue to revisit. Um, but for where we're at, at the stage we're at, it's uh, it's our, the advice we've received is that it's it's too costly and time intensive for the, for the for the benefit. I just wanted to add something to, to that. One of, one of the one of the implications of this conditional approval uh, at a stage where um, maybe the most investment has to be put into a product means that um, where in other places uh, venture capitalists or investors might be making the decision to make an investment and drive a therapy forward, we now have a regulatory authority uh, making uh, that decision. Now, um, one of the implications of that is that the, the, um, the risk capital could come into these companies earlier because of course there's a totally different financial model now of getting their return on whatever investment they make. So, you know, one thing that could happen is you could get investors coming in earlier and therefore creating a much more robust and effective uh, commercialization development pathway. Um, but the but what, but one of the you know one of the implications is that VCs are not making the decision to invest 20, 30, 40 million in that clinical data. It's the uh, the, the government and the regulatory authority. So again, there's lots of there's lots of, uh, of implications, and, and you can see by 
um, you know, Lee writing papers on this, that he's, a, he's also a thought leader in the community on these things. I think the other thing we have found in terms of a, of a, of a, of a, of a market reaction from the investment community is um, not so much the, 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 the desire to have us publicly listed. Um, in fact, to some extent, the opposite. We found um, there to be an appetite to invest in, um, uh, in bringing our technology to Japan, particularly if there was a private Japanese uh, JV or vehicle for them to invest in. So whereas it's been difficult for us so far to attract Japanese money to invest in us as a Canadian, a publicly listed Canadian company, um, there has been um, some commitments, um, soft commitments, um, expressions of interest in from Japanese investors in should we create uh, a Japanese, even a private company, in fact almost preferably a Japanese private company on our own accord or as a JV with a Japanese strategic, that would be some, that would be a vehicle in which they would be interested in investing. They being the, they being the money, the, the investors, uh, um, um, venture capital. Any other questions? Well, you know, Colin is really the expert on this reimbursement. I have to admit, I, he's, he's talked to me from time to time. There's apparently two different ways of, of deciding the reimbursement in Japan. It gets way over my head really, really fast. Um, and, and he talks about it a little bit in the paper. And, and I think his slides from, um, from the Facilitate Conference are available as well, in which he delves into it a little bit. Um, you know, they're, they're, um, as, as Michael has alluded, they're, they're driven by, by, by a cost analysis and a benefit analysis, neither of which are really very solidified at these early stages of these products. Um, but certainly there has been, you know, as we've seen already with Termos Heartsheet, there is this uh, potential for the products to be reimbursed even though the, condition, the approval is only conditional. So it is, you know, it is even for companies where reimbursement is a, is a major driver, an opportunity to, to, to potentially, if the reimbursement is appropriate, make money on the sale of the product in Japan that you can then funnel back into clinical development. I mean, maybe Michael, do you want to comment at all on your perspective, the reimbursement of your product, although it wasn't uh, conditional? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Except to say that we're happy with the outcome. <laughs> Sorry? Except to say we're happy with the outcome. JCR was involved in that. Right, yeah. So Michael is from Mesoblast, which is partnered with JCR, which is the first regenerative medicine product to get condition, uh, a full approval. Um, but it also was a subject of, uh, of, of a reimbursement decision as well. And uh, um, so maybe he, you'll get more information talking to him offline. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. All right, well, let's thank, thank Lee you. for his presentation. So now I'd like to call up to the podium Ms. Haruka Agawa, uh, who's the Director of Business Development at Jetro Toronto in charge of investment promotion. Um, and she is going to talk about how they can support Canadian companies looking to enter the Japanese market. She's also very active in supporting Japanese companies looking to set up operations in Canada and will give an overview of the services and programs available to uh, Canadian companies. So, welcome. Thank you, Michael, for kind of introduction. Uh, my name is Haruka Ogawa. I'm a director of business development at Jetro Toronto Office, and I oversee the Canada-Japan business development activities at Jetro Toronto. Um, today, in my pre presentation, I'd like to quickly introduce about what Jetro is, and also what uh, about our Jetro service for foreign companies, and how you could benefit from JETRO stands for Japan External Trade Organization. We are the Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. And we are funded by 100% by Japanese government to promote trade and invest investment between Japan and the rest of the world. And currently, we have two biggest mandates. First one is supporting foreign companies uh, exploring Japanese market and uh, set up the facility there and um, cost effectively, smoothly. Um, and make it easily. And actually, given by the, given the Japanese government, Prime Minister Abe's enthusiastic um, st 
strong economic uh, strategic plan, uh, which uh, target to double our investment, foreign direct investment by the end of 2020, uh, which, uh, which is about 32 trillion yen, um, equivalent to 3,200 uh, dollars. Uh, we are actually uh, encouraging more and more and uh, expanding our resources and forcing up putting more resources and budget, budget to these activities. And the second mission is um, supporting Japanese SME to explore overseas market, explore their products such as Japanese <coughs> sake, um, ICT content, and um, medical devices, and a variety of products from Japan to any uh, other countries. And actually, Jetro's um, mission is not limited to, to, to these two activities, but also we, uh, we support Japanese company to invest to Japan, uh, business alliance, a strategic alliance between Japan and the rest of the world countries. And uh, also the uh, some research, uh, we conduct research and um, write some article uh, about regulatory issues, market opportunity, uh, etc. The map on the left side shows our growth network uh, both globally and locally. Uh, we have over 70 offices in the world and also over 40 domestic offices in Japan, which enables us to get access to uh, global and local and local government uh, companies, also uh, get access to their accurate information on the ground. And um, in North America, we have eight locations Canada, two, one in Toronto and one in Vancouver. However, Vancouver, we only have one uh, contracted person, so every activity is um, uh, governed and operated by Jetro Toronto office. Um, uh, every activity is all across the country in Canada. And focusing on the uh, investment promotion activities, this number highlights the number of the companies that we supported as Jetro worldwide supported in the last 10 years. Uh, 12,000 and also among them uh, actually uh, 245 companies actually launched and uh, successfully launched their operation in Japan. Um, quick snapshot about the company, Canadian company that Jetro Toronto supported in the past two and three years. Secondly, I'd like to explain about the our digital service for foreign uh, companies to explore the Japanese market. We have a variety of services, a wide range of products menu, but um, yes, from the planning stage to research and materialize your business plan, and even after the uh, successfully launched in Japan for further expansion or for further second investment. But simply speaking, first one, uh, the information and the guidance, we have provide, we, we provide consultation service to foreign companies, and we have a, a variety of market reports available, uh, which include the trends of the market, how, who the players are, who the competitors are, what the current situation, where the opportunities, opportunities are for the foreign companies. And in addition to that, we also have a variety of the industrial specialists, both in um, North America and in Japan, who can provide individually uh, to respond the questions, uh, whatever you have upon your request. Um, so, for example, we have listed up some of the potential companies who potentially work with the foreign companies uh, in research and medicine. And um, from that list, we also try to attempt to uh, arrange the meeting in between to uh, see opportunity to make any kind of partnership. And using our broad network in local, uh, we have uh, close access to the local government and usually okay. local government provides many kind of the incentive plans to foreign companies. So uh, we, Jetro, um, works as the secretariat to provide those kind of information, it's what kind of incentive uh, your company, your business plan is available and applicable. And on top of that, actually, on the, the today's, what that the point that, that um, I particularly focus and introduce is that we, Jetro, will um, launch the new subsidy program uh, that is started from February um, and focusing on 
two industrial regions from the big thing and internet of things. That details I'd like to explain a little bit later. The second part is that uh, we have the free information office available in six places in Japan. Uh, when you actually go to Japan, uh, there are free office space. Also, there are advisors uh, who can advise about tax, loan and issue regulation. Um, and if you decide to establish some sort of the um, entity, uh, KK comes to uh, or procedurally, uh, we are also a uh, uh, available to um, consult the procedure, uh, what kind of the process that you have to take. Um, the third point, the point that we are actually uh, currently putting more effort is the networking support. Um, this part I also like to explain a little bit more details later. And these all three activities, we utilize both in-house and outsource uh, resources, and also we collaborate with a business industry association <coughs> such as CCRM, PROM, and OIRM, and we really look forward to collaborate more in the future from now on. Uh, now I'd like to explain a highlight on some of our program that I would like to particularly introduce today. First one is that, I, as I mentioned earlier, Jetro will um, start new support program for foreign companies uh, in two industry, region, telemedicine, and Internet of Things. The total budget is 1 billion Japanese yen, uh, which is equivalent to 120 million Canadian dollars. Um, the applicable project, uh, there are three, category, three categories, and it's Actually, all of the cases that uh, we require you to work with ja Japanese company, collaboration with the Japanese company. The first case is the establishment of global innovation site. Um, we cover uh, one third of the project costs and facilitate facilities costs such as equipment and machinery and construction. The second case is the demonstration experiment in Japan. We cover two thirds of the cost and the third case is feasible studies in Japan. Uh, we cover 100% of this cost, however, our uh, implementation up to uh, 10 million Japanese yen. Uh, more detail is actually coming sooner. Uh, we will start uh, the beginning to mid February. So if you are interested in it, please let me know and I will provide more information once that becomes available. This is about the ISPC, our free office incubation space, uh, which is in six places in Japan, uh, in major city, Tokyo, Osaka, Kobe, Fukuoka, and Nagoya. Uh, you could use up to 50 days free of charge, and after 50 days, uh, we require a small fee, but you could continue to use these facilities later on. Um, and technology partner partnering program is the, um, the, the program that we support to find the partner. Um, uh, what we usually do is that uh, we have the mailing list. Uh, there are about 200 Japanese companies have subscribers, including tech company or um, trading company or from small medium company to a large company. And we share your business plan to this company and see if there's any Japanese company interested in, in uh, partnering with, and then make a connection uh, between each other. And in addition to that, uh, we also make um, individual approaches to Japanese uh, companies upon your request. Um, if you could provide what kind of company partner you're looking for, uh, we do some research, make a list, and try to connect uh, with you. Another program that we launched uh, that is from last year is called Invest Japan Hotline. As a government and agency, Jetro works, uh, Jetro have the facility as a hotline to make a proposal, a suggestion to Japanese government officials. So if you have any kind of the uh, serious issue um, doing, business with, with doing business with Japan, uh, you could always call in uh, direct numbers, um, and Jetro will make a connection if necessary, and, or make a proposal to the government officials. 
Another thing that I'd like to introduce is called One Stop Business in Establishment Center. This is uh, actually operated by Tokyo Metropolitan Government, uh, but they have this facility inside of Jetro. And what they do is that uh, when foreign companies establish their entity in Japan, uh, in Tokyo, this is program specifically in Tokyo, uh, they um, support the administration work, uh, incorporation, uh, tax accounting, uh, visa, all kind of the uh, documentation uh, they support in English, uh, and also other, uh, a few foreign languages. So um, all the information, all our service is available on website, and except for the, the new program, subsidy program that we will start next uh, February. So please have a look, and there are also some success cases available that you can learn from uh, what how they struggle in ja into the Japanese market, what was the benefit, opportunity in Japan, uh, etc. Um, lastly, I have attached some of the related information about Japanese regenerative medicine industry. Uh, I'm not going to much details on this uh, because I, I don't think I have enough time, uh, but there are information available about Japanese cluster, uh, also important players, diversity, uh, business association uh, that I believe some of uh, the audience here have already connection and working for research. Um, and also there are information about the international expo that where the all, all the key players gathered. Um, and also some incentive plan that local government provides in lifestyle services. and thank you really much for your attention and this is my contact and also their contact with uh, of my colleague Tyson who looks after life science and research medicine area are actually is behind so please contact us uh, uh, for whatever uh, information that you are interested in thank you very much So we're right on time and we're just uh, closing up. We'll have a, a, few, a few minutes um, uh, to close off the hour for more networking and I hope that you're involved in that. Um, but I'd just like to end uh, by thanking uh, Mr. Nakamura and, and Jetro for working with us on, on this workshop. And, and would particularly like to call out Tyson. Uh, we could all thank Tyson. He's done a lot of work for this. And thank you. You know, I, th I think it's uh, it's clear Canada and Japan are leaders in regenerative medicine, and we're working in, in both individual ways and complementary ways to, to drive the industry forward. This workshop has been has been uh, I think very very valuable because we have uh, been able to learn more about the differences, but we've been able to talk about some of the details and subtleties that you wouldn't get in a in a kind of a normal uh, uh, conference or workshop, and I think that's uh, very very valuable. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the, the speakers today uh, for their presentations and on all of you for your questions and your uh, and your attention. There is more time um, to talk about this. Um, we will be we are excited um, uh, to sign a, an MOU with Firm, uh, which will very much solidify the industry focus that we have and the consortium we have with industry in Japan. And I think we're going to see great benefits uh, from that. And, and and look forward to more, more uh, opportunities there. Before I, I finally close off, um, I would like uh, uh, Dr. Nishigaki to come up and, and say a few final words. And I think you had a couple of uh, slides that you wanted to present as well.
question is uh, the investment is is this number just in Japan. So those are pretty pretty generous reimbursements actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, even if you do the the math, I think in the conversion. So um, but thank you for that additional information uh, because it does provide us with some data on what's happening. Did you want to say any uh, any final words before we go? Collaboration is why uh, we're uh, we're successful here, and, and we've had great collaboration on a number of fronts with Japan. Thank you for your attention. Have a nice day, a nice weekend.